So I keep hearing that AI is going to completely disrupt everything we do in the future and it's going to really mean that a lot of people's jobs and perhaps even mine is going to be undermined or replaced by AI. So I thought I'd take a few minutes to look at the state of AI and just see what its capabilities are, particularly around Koine Greek, which is of course what we do here at Biblical Mastery Academy. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about how AI uh, works with these things, particularly around three areas essentially. One is around teaching Biblical Greek, so we're going to, I'm going to ask it to build me a course outline, and we're going to look at that, I'm going to refine it, and we're going to see if we can get it right. We're going to also talk about building, uh, analyzing Greek texts and finding the grammatical structures. And then we're also going to look at how it's how good it is at actually putting together things like a sermon outline. So that's what we're going to cover in this video. I've actually started building my own beginning Greek course. So that's what I'm working on. So when I did this and I started that process, I thought, well, I wonder if AI would be able to help me actually create my course structure. And so that's where I started with this. And I thought, well, I'll share some of the results with you. So the first thing I did is I logged into ChatGPT and using ChatGPT 3.5, so 4.0 is out, but I'm not paying the subscription fee to get access to that. One of the things I did was I asked it, put together a course outline for me uh, to learn Koine Greek. Now, the way you phrase these questions is actually very specific and important. The more information you can give the chat GPT or any of the other AI tools, the more specific it's going to be about actually doing, you know, putting together what you want it to do. And you're going to see that as we go through here. So this first one is just put together a course outline for me so that I can learn Koine Greek. And this is what we came up with. And you can see here, this is the first out Koine out Koine outline. And it's really just, as you can see, it's, it, this is kind of its response to me. And then it comes through and it builds me a 12 week course that's gonna help me to, in theory, learn Biblical Greek. At the end of the course, now here's where it gets interesting. The course objectives reflect the genericity, if you like, of my, uh, my question here. Construct basic sentences in Koine Greek. Now, behind my request here was a, a, a kind of assumption that I'd be reading the New Testament. I don't need to be putting together basic sentences in Koine Greek. So it's assumed that you want to have both active and passive skills, and you may not need both active and passive skills. Of course, there's a whole argument around why active skills are useful, and we're also starting to include a little bit of active work in our course material. We'll come back to that another time. But for the moment, just bear in mind that this is actually quite a generic approach to a course. Um, the also, the other thing to note here is number four, have a fundamental understanding of Koine Greek grammar. You're going to see that as I refine things, this is going to become a little bit more advanced. Now, let's look at the structure here. Week one and two, we're going to be looking, looking at the Greek alphabet in week one, probably. Uh, then in week three and four, nouns and pro pro pronouns. Uh, notice here, is, it thinks there's an indefinite pronoun in Koine Greek, which there is not. So bear in mind that that's something that there's obviously some gaps in its knowledge of the language there, and maybe it's making some assumptions from English, I don't know, but there is no indefinite article in Koine Greek, so I'm not sure why it's got that there. Uh, also, down when we get into verbs, and it's interesting that it has two weeks of verbs, and you're going to learn all four, well, you're going to learn four tense forms, three tense forms, essentially. You're going to use the, see the present tense, the future tense, and the imperfect tense, which is fascinating, because if you think about Koine Greek, and you know anything about the New Testament, you've got more than just these three tense forms, and in fact, I would argue that this is perhaps looking at this from a temporal, very temporal understanding of the language. And I don't know for sure what sits in behind this, but nonetheless, notice that here there is no perfect tense form, there's no aorist tense form, uh, and there's no pluperfect uh, or anything like that. So there's a number of things missing just from the verbs and verb conjugations, and we don't come back to those, at least not in this outline. Uh, down here, adjectives looks all fine. There's probably some, some, some things missing there as well. Then we go into prepositions and conjunctions. And then we're into sentence structure. Uh, notice here that we have subject verb agreement uh, in week 11 slash 12 in sentence structure, which means that you're really not getting much of an understanding of the connection between your subject and your verb when you are learning verbs themselves, which is probably something you want to move earlier into the course structure as well, so that people know that you should have a noun and that noun needs to match its verb and number and so on. So. The, these things that probably need to be moved around a little bit. Uh, introduction to direct and indirect speech, that's kind of important, I guess. Uh, but 
simple Greek uh, sentences. And also it's going to recommend that you use the basics of biblical Greek, but yeah, you're not necessarily following the outline for the basics of biblical Greek. So you're kind of skipping around inside the grammar. Now, all of this is kind of interesting, except there's some glaring holes. Apart from the verbs that I mentioned, there are nothing about me verbs. There's no subjunctive, no infinitives, no participles either for that matter, uh, no optatives. So there's a lot of stuff missing from this course outline. And so I thought, well, okay, let's get it to do another run at this. So I said to it, could you refine this uh, so that it's more focused on reading the Greek New Testament. And you can see when I did this, if we go down here to nouns, it's still got the indefinite article. I don't know why that is. But now we've got present tense verbs, aorist tense verbs, and perfect tense verbs. So you can see here it's adjusting for the New Testament, seeing that New Testament Greek perhaps has some distinctives or focuses or emphases at least that some professors or teachers might take into account which it didn't take into account the first time. So you are seeing some refinement here in its approach to verbs. You've still got three verbs uh, in this section here. Uh, then you've got vocabulary and this is funny. Seven and eight and you're finally going to start learning vocabulary. I think if that's your plan you're probably not going to go very far in this course. Uh, then we go on to prepositions and conjunctions and reading and interpreting New Testament passages. But again, same problem, still nothing about participles. And given that they are so common in the New Testament, uh, this is a pretty major oversight. And of course, still no subjunctives. And of course, we've dropped out the future tense form, which we had before in the imperfect tense form as well. So those aren't here anymore, which means then that we've still got things missing. So I had another go. And so what I said in this third run, as I said, give me, uh, refine this for me so that it includes participles and subjunctives and the different tense forms that are missing. And it's interesting, you've gone here from 12 weeks to 16 weeks, right? And it says to adjust it, of course. But notice here we've gone from fundamentals of grammar to advanced grammar in the New Testament. So I think what we're seeing here is in the Koine, that first question I asked, it's kind of saying, okay, let's get the simplest sentences and make it so you can uh, so you can look at that. But when we're looking at the New Testament, it's saying, well, this is an actual language used by an actual group of people uh, and circulated widely and therefore is useful and important and therefore needs to be understood in and of its own right, which suggests that that is a far more complex scenario to learn than just learning some basic Greek sentence structures. So this, I think, gets us into some more advanced things. However, this is far from perfect. You can see here, introduction and uh, review and introduction in week one and two. So what this is actually doing is it's actually building on what we've done previously to sort of say, okay, you did all that other stuff in the previous course and now we're going to do this other stuff over a 16 week period, which means in week three and four, you're going to learn participles and infinitives. Uh, participles, New Testament texts, infinitives, and so on. Then we've got the subjunctive and optative mood, uh, me verbs, future verb forms, uh, the imperfect verb, and again, I think it's clear at this point, you probably want to move those those finite verb forms back up, put them before you get to infinitives and subjunctives and participles for that matter, so that you get your indicative verb forms down early on. So again, the ordering here is curious, it doesn't seem like it's thinking about the pedagogical experience. So that would be my key takeaway here, if you're going to ask ChatGPT to create you a course outline for Biblical Greek, I'm not sure you're gonna get something that is optimized for a human learning experience. It's gonna take you through some basics, it's gonna skip a whole bunch of stuff, but it's really more of an overview of the language and some key features of the language than actually teaching you to read it or use it effectively. At least that's my current takeaway from this. So is ChatGPT going to replace your average Greek grammar or Greek professor anytime soon? Absolutely not. There is always going to be a role for them, at least for the very long foreseeable future until this technology improves dramatically. However, there is a place to say, well, perhaps there's actually a little bit more to this. What about if you're not knowledgeable about biblical Greek and you would like to preach your sermons, let's say, or understand the New Testament using chat GPT to sort of analyze the Greek sentence structure for you so that you can better understand, you know, how your English maps into that Greek language. Now, this is a far more interesting question, and I think we get some much better results here. So what I did here to start with is I took a really basic sentence structure like John 1 verses 1 through 3, and I fed that into ChatGPT, and I didn't tell it what the text was. 
give me, for this text, tell me a, a, break the sentence structure down and give me a structural outline of this. And so this is what we got. You can see here, it's correctly identified. This is John 1, 1 to 3, and I remembered afterwards I left the number in there, so I don't know if that cheated or not, but hey, it's there. I took the number two out for the second verse, but there it is. Anyway, what I found fascinating was the way it talks about this. This is a profound theological statement that introduces key themes and concepts central to the Christian understanding of Jesus Christ. Uh, and here's an analysis. Okay, so it gives you the text that I gave it, and then it comes in here and it breaks all that down, gives you a translation of it, which I think is just a basic translation from an English text. I don't know that it's translating this on its own, but nonetheless, uh, what's interesting here is it's introduced, it, it gives you a decent breakdown. Uh, existed from the very beginning, echo, uh, the beginning echoes the opening words of the Old Testament, Genesis 1-1, and suggests a new creation or divine order. So that's cool. It's connected up with some key theological themes. Uh, then we have in this next piece, this is the, of course, the most controversial piece. The part, this part emphasizes the eternal coexistence of the Word with God. Uh, it highlights a personal relationship between the Word and God, which is fascinating to me as a Trinitarian. This clearly is, I would say, recognizing that that's how this has traditionally been understood. This statement is significant uh, in the Christian theology as it affirms the divine nature of the Word. Again, Trinitarian, hurrah for me. Um, and then it just suggests that the Word is both distinct from God and yet fully divine. Uh, so again, very good. It's captured the key themes here quite well. Uh, reiterates the words eternal presence and divine uh, and relationship with God and so on. So we can see here that it's actually done a pretty reasonable job of breaking this structure down, understanding it, giving me a, a reliable translation of which Greek words relate to which English words and how I should understand it, what the significance of that is. What it hasn't given me and what I kind of hoped for here was more of a grammatical understanding of this text. So it would break it down and sort of explain, for instance, maybe the Granville Sharp rule or maybe how the article was working in these cases or how Pross worked and things like that. But it hasn't really done that at all. It's just sort of given us broad, generic kind of outlines, if you like, that we can kind of use and plug into this. When it comes to a structural outline, it gives us two key pieces. The eternal existence of the word, uh, and you can see here, this is it's just taking that outline it created a moment ago, and then it's put all that under one key headline, and then we've got a second one here, which is the creative role of the word as well. And I think these two structural headings would actually be quite sufficient if you wanted to turn this into a preaching outline. So I think it's actually kind of helpful. If you're a pastor or a preacher and you don't know Greek, this could actually be quite a helpful tool for learning and seeing how the Greek structure breaks itself down and maps to what you've got in your English Bible. And from that then, you can then create outlines that might map better to the Greek grammar, if you like, that uh, that we see in the New Testament, even if you don't know Greek. So I can see here how uh, ChatGPT can make you perhaps a, a, a preacher who sticks closer to the text, and I think that's probably a good thing. But we're not done. I wanted to see how this would go with a slightly more complex piece of text, and so what I did is I fed in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21, and this time I remembered to take out all of the verse numbers, so I didn't tell it where it was from again, and it recognized again exactly where it was from, and it saw, uh, it understood some of the outline of this. So let's have a look at this. This is the analysis. So first of all, avoid drunkenness. Ephesians 5.18 breaks into two sections, okay? I don't know that I would break this into two sections. I'm not sure that I would try and build a moral message or moral component to Ephesians 5.18. I think the key point is the second half of it, be filled with the Spirit. I think it's about what controls you. It doesn't really pick up on that in this passage. It doesn't talk much about what is it that's controlling you. Is it wine? Is it you know external substances you're using or whatever it happens to be? Or is it that you're being controlled and driven and guided by the Holy Spirit? That's really the key question I think I would drive for a sermon outline. We'll get back to this in just a moment. But then the other interesting thing here is that all of this, from verse 19 all the way to verse 22, is, a, is consists of participles that are sub, subordinate to be filled with the Spirit. So all of these participles from verse 19 to verse 22 all tell you this is what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. And we've talked about this on this channel before, and you can find the video link to that up here. But here, what they've done is they've broken into two sections. So, and that's okay. It's not necessarily wrong to do that, but I would be inclined to try and 
keep those together. And if you're going to break them into multiple sermons, you know, part one, part two, part three would be kind of what I would want to do. You can see here then that what we've got from a structural outline is pretty consistent with what we get from a sermon outline point of view. We've got three again, and I think again, I would probably just have two. I would do one on uh, verse 18 and then another one on verse 19 to 21. Um, and then for the preaching outline, introduce the context of the book of Ephesians, uh, within the book of Ephesians, living a spirit-filled life. So it kept verse 18 together from a preaching perspective, and I think that's good. I don't know that the consequences of being drunk are the key point of that verse, so you'd want to be a little bit wise about that. Uh, however, again, I would, like I said, I would probably keep these sections together in one large outline, even if I was to break that into multiple sermons, and I would have you know, spirit-filled living, part one, part two, part three, and then break each of the participles down and use that. So I would, again, some of these can be connected together. But the point to see here, really, I think, is that if you are a preacher and you are thinking about can, can Koine Greek be helpful to me and can ChatGPT and some of these AI tools help me with my sermon preparation, yeah, I think it can. I think it can take some of that hard work out. But here's the question, like I said, I'm not probably, I probably wouldn't preach from this sermon outline and you can probably see why. This is one big long sermon, I think, and I don't think you'd want to do that. I think this gives itself to a number of smaller sermons, so you can modify it a little bit. And certainly the more information you feed into ChatGPT, the better it's going to be for getting you exactly what you want. But therein lies part of the question and part of the challenge. If you don't know what you don't know, how do you know what to ask ChatGPT to give you. And that's part of the challenge with all of this. So even if you don't know any Greek, it's still going to be a little bit of a challenge at this stage to know if what you're getting from ChatGPT is good and reliable. But having said that, it's still probably better than just sort of going from an English text without any introduction or background into the Greek whatsoever. It depends how good you are with English, I guess. Uh, would I encourage someone like Steve Lawson, who uh, doesn't use Greek, to uh, to go to something like this? Or perhaps uh, Jack Hughes, another one of the preachers who I know and love, who again doesn't really go back to the Greek from a translation point of view uh, to translate the text for themselves. Those people don't do that for themselves. They work primarily from the English. Would I encourage them to use this? I don't think they need to. I think they're probably better than what this can actually pump out. But for the, the average person, I think this could provide some value. But here's another thing just to bear in mind, it's particularly when it comes to learning Greek and using Greek for yourself. The whole task of learning Greek is an inherently human task. And what I mean by that is that you and I are actually engaging in the task of learning Greek for a reason. And that reason is so that we can read it for ourselves and use the tools for ourselves without depending on things like ChatGPT, English translations, and so on. And coming from that comes this clarity uh, in the text, understanding what it means and how it's written and how the author is using the different parts of speech to convey the meaning he's trying to get across. Secondly, to get confidence, right? We want that confidence from the text that comes from being able to see clearly what he's actually saying. And then we get much faster in the text as a result of that, which means that things like a sermon outline like this, we may not need to go look at something like ChatGPT to go and get that simply because we're actually going to be a lot quicker with the text for ourselves. And of course, the more we're engaging in the text, that gives us greater vitality, greater love for Christ, greater knowledge of Him, and it impacts our own walk with Christ as well. And so I don't think that whatever we do with AI is never going to replace that element where it actually impacts us as human beings. Because us as human beings, interacting with the original languages for ourselves is not something we can replace with AI. If we give that task to AI, well, it's no longer us learning it, in which case we're not going to get that clarity, confidence, vitality, and efficiency that we've been looking for, and therefore ask the question, well, why bother? So I think AI is a great little tool. It's a good thing to sort of get you started, particularly if you're not super confident in certain areas. However, it's not going to replace a human being in the short term. Of course, this stuff is always developing, always growing, and it, you know we'll see what happens over time. But I think there's an inherently human element to interaction with the Word of God and God Himself that cannot be replaced with AI. If you are interested in learning Greek, perhaps even looking at the beginning Greek course that I'm putting together right now, download the initial outline I put together for that course. You can do that at bma.to slash rethinkingbg, rethinking beginning Greek, uh, and I'll send you a, a link to that 
so that you can download that and get involved with seeing how we break it into lots of small, consistent, easy to do steps.